Welcome to Dear Sandy. I'm Sandy Galef, a member of the New York State Assembly representing parts of Northern Westchester and parts of Putnam County. And today we're really going to talk about um, United Way of Westchester Putnam and what is in the news and all of the new programs that they have. And it's going to be a very exciting uh, discussion that I'm going to have uh, with Ilana Sweeney. And you are the CEO, President and CEO of the United Way of Westchester Putnam. Yes, I am. Thank you very much for having me today, Sandy. It's always good to be with you. Right. And we've done other programs together, but there's so United Way just keeps changing um, what you're working on, your, your new activities, your new programs, your new issues. Uh, and that's very exciting. And you know, some things change and some things never change. But we did a study called ALICE, which stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. And what we found was in Westchester County, 40% of the households are struggling just to meet basic needs. That's if they get a flat tire, they may not mm -hmm. be putting food on the table. And that's pretty astounding. And the numbers have gone up. It was 36%. So as we're doing our work, we're trying to focus on that population and do what we can in different ways in the community, both in terms of children, in terms of the financial stability of adults, and the access to services for the people in the community, as well as helping the not-for-profits. Right. Well, that is amazing. 40% of households. 40%. And it's 33% in Putnam, with the difference being the poverty is a mm -hmm, little bit mm -hmm. less in Putnam. But yeah, I don't think people realize in a community as affluent as that that we live in, that people are really struggling and that they shouldn't be ashamed that they're struggling because there are so many. And these are people who are working hard, mm -hmm, sometimes mm -hmm. working one, two, and three jobs, and they still can't make ends meet. Mm -hmm. that, so you take those that information and you then, through United Way, try to figure out what kind of programming you would have or what kind of outreach you would have? Exactly. So we do a number of different things with that. So right now we're working with IBM, for example, and we're mapping out uh, where people are living, not their exact address, but at the communities mm -hmm. that they're living in, what services are in the community, what is the access to transportation, what is the access to food banks, what is the access to child care, to try and see where we have gaps in service and where we need to develop more service or different service or service delivered mm -hmm, in a different mm -hmm. way. And, you know, many of these people are working shifts. We have a large number of individuals working in the healthcare field. And we know in many cases their, their salaries are not at the top of the salary ranges. So we know they're struggling and we know they're working and we want them to know that there is help available for them. And we want people to know that they shouldn't be ashamed, mm -hmm. that they're, they're not in the minority. Uh, that there are friends and neighbors all over. And it may be we go to the gas station, it may be we go to the hospital. No matter where we go, you're meeting multiple Alice's in the course of a day. So what we've been trying to do is to develop programming that will help children to be more prepared, that will work on the financial wellness of the parents, and uh, to be able to help them to access services if they need it. Mm -hmm. So if there is a service needed, going back to one of your, your earlier statements about child care. Say there, um, you see in a community that they're just not adequate child care provisions. Do you then reach out to um, the child care council oh, absolutely. and say this is I mean how this is how you're dealing with the nonprofits that are working in the community Exactly the child care council is a wonderful wonderful organization and we work with them all of the time in partnership especially on early childhood readiness on child care on issues like that we'll advocate with them their issues are mm -hmm. our issues as well and if we see a gap if we see a problem for example they're going to be sitting down and going over the data with us with IBM we've been sharing back and forth as mm -hmm. we do things so working together we work smarter mm -hmm. not necessarily harder but we get better effects and better outcomes for the community and the individuals who live in it mm -hmm. do you also find out I know you've got a wonderful program that we keep trying to add more money in on the state budget but the 211 um, system I, I think we're all used to calling uh, 911 if we have an emergency um, and the city has another one I think which 311. is 311 and in Westchester and Putnam, and I guess the rest of the, the state? The rest of the state, and actually most of the nation. 
And most of the nation. Most wow. of the nation, yeah. In fact, New York is completely covered by the 211 system. The country is covered except for some small pockets in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, 311 was a government system in New York City. Actually, if you have a health and human service call, when you call 311, it will flip over to 211. But here in the Hudson Valley and across the rest of the state, if you dial 211 for any health and human service need, you can call 24 hours a day, 365 mm -hmm. days a year, and someone will be there to talk to you, to talk through your problems and your issues, and to help you connect to help. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter either what language you speak. We have bilingual staff and we have a language line. We have access to information in 200 languages and dialects. So what kind of, uh, you must learn from those phone calls what some of the needs are because if you, if you can't then send somebody someplace because there isn't a service, um, then you know that there's also we have a hole in our in our exactly. programming. Exactly, and sometimes that hole may be something that you see over time. Sometimes it could be in the course of a disaster or whatever. We mm -hmm, run mm -hmm. reports. For example, we could r run a report on your district, your mm -hmm. assembly district, and see what the needs are. Overwhelmingly, the calls we get are for basic needs. Food, housing, utilities. But there are a wide range of other things. We do services for homeless veterans, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, just about anything you could call for, even recycling in Westchester, we can give you mm -hmm, information. Mm -hmm. If you need a shelter, we can tell you where the shelters are. If you need a, a food bank, we can tell you where they are and what the operation is, and we'll do it what's closer to your home or place of employment, whatever works for you. But the interesting thing, Sandy, is that people will call, and they'll call for one need, and when our staff start to talk to them, very often, they have four or five needs, mm -hmm. and they might be greater than the initial need that they called for. So it's not a matter of someone reading from a script or, or just pulling out any resource. They really try to personalize it and help people. And how do you train all those individuals that answer the phone calls? That must be incredibly difficult because there, there's so many services in our counties. That's and to right. know and understand all of them has to, I don't know whether you give people a big log. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we have computers for. Okay. We, we keep a database of mm -hmm. services, which we have two people who spend all of their time just updating the services. Everything has to be updated at least once a year. When someone is hired, they go through what we call AIRS certification, Alliance for Information Referral Services. And it's about six months of training. They take tests. And we monitor calls. Uh, we do on-site training at all times. We want to make sure that the quality of the service, the quality that people are getting is top-notch. How do we, I know I advertise it every once in a while in my newsletters uh, for people to know to call, but how do you get out this message generally? Is that, is that difficult it's to do? It's our biggest challenge because, you know, as we call you, and uh, I know you were talking mm -hmm. to Peter Harcum on one of your shows, you know, he's new in his position. So we talk to his predecessors, constituent services people. We talk to your constituent mm -hmm. services people to call 211 to get the message off. But then all of a sudden you have a change in personnel, right. not only at levels of government, but in the not-for-profits and elsewhere. And all of a sudden you have to tell people all over again about right. 211. They had the same problem when 911 started. It took a very, very mm -hmm. long time mm -hmm. for people to find out about 211, about 911. Right. Uh, we want people to be able to learn about 211. You say, burning building, call 911 burning question, call 211. <laughs> so it, it's very, very difficult. And for all of your listeners, you know, you may not think that you need help, although I think I've even called 211 for information. <laughs> but you're not, your neighbor might need someone, something, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the person you meet in the grocery store. It's really important that people know about the existence of 211 and that the help is there. And when we move to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, one of the things that I said to my staff is we need to do this because some, sometimes the biggest crisis happens oh, at weekends. 2 in the morning. Oh, my goodness. Right. You know, you're lying there. You can't sleep. You're worried right. about some particular issue. 
and we can help you. And we we mm -hmm. also man the Putnam Crisis Line. We d we take about 250 crisis calls a year. We've averted mm -hmm. suicides. We have a woman called who was going to drive off a bridge with her two children, so and we were able to connect with the police and get her help. Right. So if somebody um, suicide, uh, I mean that that is incredible that people would call. What kind of, per what, who is at the other end of that phone call or do you send that over to a specialist? Our staff are trained in crisis and in fact, even if all of the calls lines are busy, it will come across the computer, crisis mm -hmm, call mm -hmm. coming in and they will get off a call very, very quickly to take that call. Mm -hmm. They're specially trained, everyone is trained in different of our contracts and programs, but anyone can take a crisis call. They're, they're trained for all, but some mm -hmm. are specially trained. And where are you located? We are located on Central Park Avenue, 336 Central Park Avenue in White Plains. But interestingly, we take calls from Long Island right up to the Canadian border out of oh Westchester. Oh my goodness, wow. <laughs> 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 it's the way it goes. Well, continue to do a great job with, with the program, and, and everybody should let uh, their friends and neighbors know about 2 and one it's, it's so important. It absolutely is, and we're doing a lot of very interesting things with it now. One of the things that we're doing is recruiting foster parents for Westchester and Putnam County, and that's been pretty exciting. I don't think people realize the need that there is for foster parents, and all you need is room in your house, Mm -hmm. and room in your heart to take a child in. There's a particular need for foster parents for babies and for teenagers and of course for special needs. And so we just did a very neat thing, a little video that played, did you see the movie Instant Family was coming to the theaters? No, I mean I did see that it was, yeah, yes. Yeah, it was it, about a family who took in foster children uh -huh. and adopted. And we just got this idea and contacted the theaters, put together a really quick 15 second video. Uh, mm -hmm. Your friend Casey uh, did the voiceover for us. And we have a whole campaign, Kids Be Kids, about getting parent, people to become foster parents. And if you're interested in it, just call 211 and mm -hmm, we'll do mm -hmm. the screening. We'll give you the information, whatever it is that you need, because we want every child to have a home right. and parents to care for and them. And how did you get that knowledge that we really had more needs in the foster care? We, we work very, very closely with other organizations and we work very closely with the Department of Social Services. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a well-known challenge. They have real goals to get every child into a loving home. And they have enlisted us to help them do it. And we're, we're having a good time doing it, mm -hmm. but it's such a good cause. Right. Um, and if you think about, these, are, these kids aren't freaks. These are normal, everyday kids who right. just get so excited when they can stay in one place with one family that's going to care for them and give them the attention that they need. Right, so important. Um, another area that I think you ventured into is in the whole area of Medicaid uh, and people going to, well, there was a whole issue of people going to hospitals and making sure that they don't have to come back again. Exactly. That they don't pick up any kind of uh, illness that would have them back. But I think you've been, you've been kind of directing your services to those that are on, on Medicaid? Yeah, so, you know, Medicaid costs for the state, as you know, it's one of the mm -hmm. largest pieces of our state budget. And so we were working with one of the other United Ways in the Capital Region around something called a DISRIP, an acronym that I'm not going to define for you. But basically what it was was that they were trying to keep people who had gone into the hospital, who were on Medicaid, from re-entering the hospital because what would happen is they would get out and in a very, very short period of time they were right back into the hospital. Right. So they decided to use 211 to make outward bound calls to those individuals. Oh, when they're out of the hospital? When they're out of the hospital. Call? We get the information when they're mm -hmm. leaving and we make a follow-up phone call. And what we have found is that very often there are other social needs that are causing them to end up back into the hospital. It may be that they're not getting the proper food and nutrition. It may be a problem in their housing. It could be some other issue. So they found, uh, and we've been getting great results, that by addressing those issues, it's actually keeping those people from readmitting into the hospital. Which is a good thing, it's not a great to go thing. back to the hospital. It's a great thing. Even beyond the money aspect. 
That's right. <laughs> Nobody it's wants good. to Nobody be in the hospital. Nobody wants to go back again. Despite right. our great hospitals right. in this right. area. Right. right. So that that is just really wonderful. So how did that, so that program just, just came up because probably it was through the state or the county that they recognized that right. this each, was going on? Each region of the state has one of these DISRIPs and they're trying to look to see what things they can put into place. Mm -hmm. And in the capital region of the state, and as I mentioned, we take calls all the way up to the Canadian border, they found that this was something that they needed to address that was going to help in their region. And because they are part of 211 and work with us, we talked about it and we're working with the Alliance for Health. We're compliant with all the FERPA regula regulations, mm -hmm. so people do have privacy, um, but we're getting incredible results with it. That is great. And that's a program I wouldn't have ever thought that the United Way would be involved with somehow. It just <laughs> well, you It's know, great. You've picked up on so many different kind of issues. We tend to work in the areas of education, income, and health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this certainly did fit under the health piece. And you spoke a little bit about um, educational opportunities for children and so on. And I know that United Way has been doing some work in my communities. Um, Absolutely. Yes, and tell so, us a little well, bit about what's going on at Pisco. Education is my love, right? Mm -hmm. So we started out with something called A2I, Assessment to Instruction, and this is something that through a very large federal grant, a $15 million federal grant, we were working with the University of California, Irvine, um, MDRC, which is an evaluator and digital promise schools to try and see if we could do something to get those children who were not on grade level and might be coming to school two years behind on grade level by the end of third grade. Um, and it's been proven that by individualizing the education according to certain algorithms right. and working with the teachers that, that children actually can make up the loss and get to grade level, even starting out way behind. So we started that program working with the teachers. We're working in Elmsford and in Peekskill on that and with that we wanted to go a little bit deeper with some of the schools we were working with and others and so we started to work with the new superintendent in Peekskill and he wanted to start a Saturday Academy and he asked mm -hmm. if the United Way would help in coordinating it and bringing resources to the community bringing together some of the not-for-profits so we've been oh, doing that great. and having a great time on Saturdays huh? in Peekskill what um, age group are we talking about? We're actually talking all, all age groups all in age groups. They do it at, at the high school, and the parents need to come with the children. Mm -hmm. And they've got all kinds of family activities and access to resources, and it's just been a great fun thing. Uh, with that, we've also been working with Ossining. We have a bookmobile in Ossining that we, I think last year is when we started with the bookmobile and we're collecting children's books birth to five throughout the year and they get distributed through the bookmobile in Ossining and by other avenues in, in our other communities that we're working with and it's wonderful because they found that 60 percent of low-income children do not have one children's book in the home. Oh my goodness. Wow. I was delivering wow. some books to a, a <laughs> a Head Start Center and I was talking to the children and having a grand old time and I said, and who reads to you at home? And some of them would raise their hand and say a parent or a brother or a sister. Mm -hmm. And one little boy raised his hand and he looked at me and he said, I don't have any children's books in my house, just one comic book. Oh my goodness. So if that wow. doesn't break your heart. That does, yeah, so we do accept does. books year round uh -huh. and we do distribute them year round. We've been distributing them as well in Peak Seal. Mm -hmm. uh, where we do did, people, how do people know about where you distribute or where, work, where to bring children's books? We work with books? the schools and okay. with the not-for-profits in the community to find out uh -huh. where they can best, best be distributed to get into the hands of kids and the hands of right. families. So in Ossining, we go, we'll do community events. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll go out when the food, food bank truck is there and deliver them. So it's all different ways that we do it to get the books to the kids. So we want them to have them and they get to keep them. Right. They're excited about that. We were able to distribute backpacks in both Ossining and Peekskill. Ossining had said they needed them. We mm -hmm, started mm -hmm. to check. They were able to get some. We said to Peekskill, do you want them? They were overjoyed because right. so many of these children don't have them. We helped with getting 
coats and, and hats mm -hmm. and mittens mm -hmm. um, working with Peak Skill. So we have a lot going on in your district. Right. So you're reaching out to United Way is trying to be the organizer, but reaching out to the not-for-profits. To the we, yes, we always work with not-for-profits. Right. What's a little bit different is we're doing a lot more work with schools. Mm -hmm. And with our reading program, within the next year, we'll be doing more to align uh, school and community and giving some more resources to the community-based organizations as well so that we can really maximize what the children are learning in school. Mm -hmm. It's exciting so, stuff. So you're raising money through United Way and, and the money is going out to a lot and of these programs that we've it, talked about. Yeah, it's going into the community. It's, it's helping the programs. It's giving the support. And of course, you know we have the Not-for-Profit Summit to give mm -hmm. the support to um, in the training professional training to the not-for-profits. And I don't know, do you know about our Gifts in Kind program? Uh, Gifts in Kind. Gifts in Kind. So, so a, contributor, a contributor. A contributor to United of Way. Goods. Right. People will call and they will say, we have a couch. We have a someone called with a full set of Waterford Crystal. Now, I don't oh. think any not-for-profit <laughs> really needed that, but we try to place things where they're needed. And then uh -huh. we also participate in something called Good 360. So if stores have things that they're mm -hmm, not, mm -hmm. that they have oversupplies of, for example, we have an arrangement with Walmart where we pick up a pallet that goes to not-for-profits um, once a week. Uh, we work with other stores and we've given out to not-for-profits this year about $2.5 million worth of goods. Oh, wow. And it can be everything from mm -hmm. Uggs boots for kids mm -hmm. to office equipment to sheets and towels. So the advantage to the family is wonderful. What happens with the business that does that? Is that a, a charitable contribution exactly. for them? Exactly. So, it, you know, it's goods that overstock, end of, end of season items, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they will donate it to us through Good360. They work as the broker with us. We then reach out to all of our not-for-profits and say, who can use it? Mm -hmm. So how is the all the changes on the federal level with... Um, the federal tax situation. Do you have any idea now what's going to be happening yeah, with think, charitable contributions? I think people still don't know. United Way is advocating for an above-the-line deduction so anyone mm -hmm, can mm -hmm. take the charitable deduction. That has not happened yet. We are a bit concerned. We, we have had a lot of our donors bundling their gifts. So in this year they're giving a couple of gifts and mm -hmm. versus and then this year they'll itemize, the next year right. they won't. Uh, we're very concerned about the fact that um, we there's the cap, the $10,000 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. cap, because school taxes alone are so high in the area. And we don't know what's going to happen, what kind of an effect that's going to have on charity if people mm -hmm. will not do their charitable giving. Um, my suspicion is those people who are giving to their churches will continue to give to their churches no matter mm -hmm. what. And those people who are high-end will probably be more apt to bundle. Mm -hmm. um, there are different things that they can do. And there's some really interesting approaches we can do to help people uh, if they want to figure a way to be able to give to charity um, in some ways they may not have thought of. There are loans they can do to charities. There are there's the bundling that I mentioned. If people have a summer or a weekend home that they're going mm -hmm. to sell and they want to donate, there are a lot of different, excuse me, different things they can do. Uh, people can set up charitable gift annuities. There are many, many things we can help them with. But we know that people in our community need help. And we're hoping that charitable giving is not hurt, but right. nobody knows the answer right. for sure. Right, right. Well, I hope it doesn't hurt either. Uh, let me just, I, I know you also have a program to help people with their tax. Absolutely. Don't you? <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> is that for everybody or well, a certain level it, of people? It's for people who would qualify for the earned income tax credit. So they're making some money. Um, mm -hmm. They're certainly not making enough to itemize. Uh, but their income level, and I can't remember the exact amount, but their income level is fairly low. They can call 211 and we'll be able to tell them if they qualify or not for the earned income tax credit. And if they do, we will help them to set up a free appointment to help to have their taxes done for them. And we've had people who said they've 
gone and you know thought they were going to have to pay and all of a sudden they were getting a significant amount of money back the average money back is between five and six hundred dollars uh, so that's a nice little right. extra bit of change when you're really struggling day to day right absolutely absolutely and we'll be starting to take those calls next week uh, through April 15th uh, we are also putting on volunteers to take just the tax calls not our other calls mm -hmm to help set up those appointments. So if anyone feels that they may qualify for the earned income tax credit, please, they should call 211. And if they want to volunteer to help take those tax calls during the day up until seven at night, they can also call and we'll be happy to train them and put them to work. I think you'll be busy this year. I know we'll be bus busy this year. <laughs> that way. So have there been programs that you've just kind of dropped with United Way that just aren't aren't you know don't rise to the level of some of these other programs yeah, you talked well, about? Yeah, well I think we're doing some different things. For example, we've been taking a look at our financial education mm -hmm. and we're revamping that into financial wellness because what we've realized, financial education has been around for a long time, but what we've found looking at the research is that people really need coaching. They really need some consistent help to change their behaviors. So we're doing some things to change the way we deliver that, how we deliver it, where we focus our efforts. And we're about to announce some other very exciting things. You'll have to come have me come back to tell you about <laughs> them. But we will be working for people to be able to get low cost loans in the workplace. So that will be a, a very exciting program that's going to help a lot of people to get out of debt and then to be mm -hmm. able to start on the path to financial wellness. I, I suppose when I when I ask you that question, our population really has changed in our it counties has. over time, and and so with it, you know, United Way really needed to change. It, it really has, and you know, if we if we take a look, I look at some of our school districts and some of the challenges that they're having, or even in United Way, we we have to make sure we have bilingual staff because mm -hmm. we want people to be able to feel that services are accessible to them. So we have seen a big change with that. We've had a change in children coming to school. Um, in their readiness, you know, perhaps where people have come from, they don't do the same kind of preparation that, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. people here are used to doing and getting their kids ready for school. So we see there are different needs. We also see that many people are afraid to access services. They're afraid that someone might come after them, they might be deported or whatever. If they if they go for any kind and of help, and they really feel that with United Way, you, well, you with find United that? Way, we're not finding it right. because of the way we operate, and we do find two one one because it is confidential. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. can call and get the information on the help, and no one needs to know who they are or where they are or where they came from. And that that's really true of anybody that calls, right? Two one one. It is confidential unless you don't want it to be, Right, I suppose. And I think the other thing that has changed with United Way is we're not as much of a funding agency as we used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, we do still fund some certain things, but we're really trying to be more the facilitator in the community and move things in the community and then be able to place the funds where it's needed and to be able to get certain things going. Right. Well, I think you've done a great job at United Way. Thank and, you. Uh, and I think all these new programs that you have are just amazing. And we didn't cover all of them, but uh, I want to thank you so much for being here, Alana. And may you have uh, wonderful successes in this new year. Well, my and pleasure, and I'll be seeing you in Albany. Oh, you'll be up there to lobby for <laughs> <got> everything. <laughs> to advocate. <laughs> to advocate, right. Uh, I just want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank all of you uh, for watching. Uh, please uh, give me a call if you have any questions, 914-941-1111. Thank you very much.